to normal, but how do you go from normal to exceptionally high performing? And in particular, the ideas or the concepts that we're gonna talk about from positive organizational scholarship today include sharing speaking space in, and especially sharing spa speaking space in meetings, we're gonna talk about respect, creating respectful connections and respectful cultures and how much that actually has an uh, impact on bottom line results of whatever a team or an organization is um, uh, has as its mission to, to carry out and take care of. And then the idea of selecting and training for teamwork as one particular place or way to create more uh, respectful organizations, organizations where people work really well together. I've been very influenced by a center at the University of Michigan called the Center for Positive Organizations. I'll send out a handout later that um, Sarah Heyman can pass on to all of you for people who might be interested in more information. But I also just want to um, mention that uh, the University of Michigan Center for Positive Organizations is, uh, has a website that has all kinds of resources and public talks available if you're interested in what we do today and would like to know more. Most of you met me in the previous hour, but for anybody who didn't, in addition to working one-on-one -on -one and in uh, virtual groups doing coaching, I have a book, The Coach's Guide for Women Professors, who want a successful career and a well-balanced life. A lot of what we're gonna talk about today comes from the 10th chapter on leadership. And the book also has chapters on work-life balance, negotiation, networking, how to have more time, other topics related to career success and life balance. So going back to this idea of shared speaking space, I wanna start by sharing a story from Laurel Ritchie. Laurel Ritchie was a former head of the Women's National Basketball Association. Prior to that though, she spent 20 years working for the advertising firm Ogilvy & Mather. While she was at Ogilvy & Mather, her accounts were doing great. Financially, she was um, doing good work for the company. She went on vacation and her entire team went to HR and asked to be transferred to work under a different leader. Laura Ritchie had no idea that was coming. She thought things were going really well, but it turned out that they were not happy because she was making all the decisions and just telling them what they needed to do to implement them. And they didn't feel like they had much of a sense of personal agency over how things were getting done. And it made it not a lot of fun for them to work in her group. Richie pretty quickly realized that she would have a bunch of really good ideas, but no team to carry them out if she didn't do something differently. She's somebody who is really a quick thinker and um, quickly comes up with solutions, ideas. So if she was sitting in a team meeting where people were talking about possibilities or challenges, she would immediately think of an answer and say, okay, we can do this. That's the what wasn't working for her with her team. And so she bought a silly putty egg and she opened the silly putty egg during meetings and took out a piece of silly putty so she'd have something to do to help hold herself back. And she just sat there and um, stretched the silly putty while she let her team talk. And what she said she learned was that there's more than one good way to get things done. And by shifting her style, she generated tremendous loyalty. One of the people who was already to, to get asked to move to a different leader or was asking to get moved after Richie changed how she handled her meetings came back and said, you know, I love working as part of your team. I would walk through fire for you. So she huge shift in, in what happened. And Laurel Ritchie was onto something about team meetings. Anita Woolley, Tom Malone, and Chris Shabris did research, or they do research on collective intelligence. And one of the things they found is that the teams that perform the best 
are not the ones meet up with the people with the highest collective IQ. In fact, there's some different characteristics that make for the smartest teams. And two of those characteristics, two of the main characteristics are sharing speaking space and also having people on the team who are good at reading facial expressions and picking up on emotions. So uh, sharing spacing, I kind of attending to not just the facts, but to the, um, the emotions behind what people are saying. I wanna focus uh, today though on the, the first uh, aspect, that aspect of sharing space in meetings. And I'm gonna, move us into breakout rooms in just a minute and ask you to take about five minutes to discuss the question, um, what kind of strategies can facilitators use in team meetings to encourage sharing of the space? So that could be facilitation techniques they use, it could be um, ways they structure the meeting, whatever they might do, um, out, things they might do outside of the meeting. And um, if you also have ideas about what people who are not the facilitators can do as well to support making sure everybody um, gets space um, to be heard in the meeting, you can include that as well. So I am going to just go up for a minute here and go to breakout rooms. Okay, so we're going to have four or five people in a room and again about five minutes to discuss and brainstorm different kinds of strategy structures you can use to make sure everybody gets speaking space in meetings. And I'm going to create those rooms and open them now and you can go ahead and just choose one to join. Um, going back to the agenda, um, we talked about, you know, if you do have maybe self-identified introverts or people that may not always share, um, maybe placing, you know, if you want to talk about an idea or a new concept, placing on the agenda and saying, we would like to hear from you your ideas. Um, so giving them the opportunity to kind of think about it ahead of time so they don't feel so much on the spot in the moment. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, so having people know what uh, to plan ahead is huge. I'm doing a, a group right now that meets once a month for associate deans, and I, I know one of them, and I know she's like often the last person to talk, but before the first meeting, she said, is there anything I should plan? And I gave her a few things that I was going to ask, and she was the first one to jump in, which she never would have done if she hadn't had the question ahead of time. So that's great. Good. What else? In our group, uh, Mallory mentioned, you know, just staying open-minded to everyone and just open, being open-minded to all ideas. And, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat is how she put it, so. <laughs> that's nice. Nice, yeah, and I have to say, once I was in a group where they were asking for ideas um, about how we could recruit more members and I suggested something and somebody immediately said, oh, we've tried that before. And I have to say, like, if you have new people in your group and you want to make sure they never say anything again, um, uh, you know, uh, that's a great way to do that. I mean, maybe say, you know, that's an interesting idea. We tried that, but maybe, you know, there's a different way we could do it now, or maybe we should revisit that um, would be a much more inviting response. Good. Anything else anybody wants to add from your conversations? I would just add um, that I follow up after the meeting if somebody's been particularly quiet, if I find, you know, if I think maybe they've had something to say, but perhaps didn't feel comfortable sharing it with the larger group, um, just checking in afterwards and saying, hey, you know, I, what about this? And just kind of maybe teasing it out, um, you know, in a more private way, um, just to make sure that, that they have the opportunity to be heard, just another option. Good, and building on what Stephanie and some other people said, I would just also add, um, there's somebody who you um, know you might appreciate their contribution who may not be a person who tends to jump in. Um, somebody had said something quite like this, but just having a conversation with them ahead of the meeting and then saying, 
do you mind if I um, call on you to say more about that during the meeting, you know, and then say, hey, Stephanie and I were talking earlier, Stephanie, would you mind sharing that idea that you had with the group? Um, I call that a warm, a warm call as opposed to a cold call in a meeting um, so people know to expect it. So some other ways to share space could be um, if you have a question that might be controversial, you could take a poll ahead of time and share the results of an anonymous poll. So people who maybe have less seniority or less power in the group might um, not feel concerned about saying what they really think for fear of you know, somebody who's powerful not liking them. Um, another strategy is uh, to go around the room and have everybody comment before anybody comments twice. Um, if um, you, people have mentioned, if you notice some people haven't said something to say, you know, you're welcome to pass, but I just want to check in and say, you know, Jody, do you have anything you want to add to this? Um, and then um, you can also, somebody had mentioned brainstorms in my group as a way to um, hear from lots of people. Sometimes in brainstorms, I've been told that um, you get, generate more ideas if you that people do it like writing their ideas on post-it notes or something like that, or write it up on the paper. If people are just calling out answers, sometimes you don't get as many different ideas. Um, also, if you have a large meeting, breaking people up into smaller groups to discuss something before you bring it back to the large group. So having people talk in twos, join with another group of two, and then open it up to the whole group, you might get a lot more participation. I also wanted to ask, is anybody who is um, on uh, this conference familiar with something called a five finger vote, uh, a five finger vote that's used as a way to assess how supportive people are of something before actually taking it to a vote. So I'm going to say a little more about that. That's a strategy in meetings where um, you have something where you could just vote on it, but if you get 51% for and 49% against, and you really need everybody to move forward if you're gonna implement this idea, that's not really gonna work for you. That's great if you need to decide where are we gonna order lunch? Are we getting lunch from Chipotle or Panera? You know, maybe it just doesn't matter that much and you just take a vote and you don't wanna spend a lot of time on it. But if it's something that's quite important and you need buy-in, I'm periodically saying, Given our proposal as we have it thus far, how supportive of you? One finger means like you really don't like it, you know, not there at all. Five is I'm completely on board, or you could hold up any number of fingers in between. If people are holding up two fingers or three fingers, maybe you then say, um, hey, uh, Joe, I noticed that you, you know, just had up two fingers. Can you let us know what's like one thing that we uh, need to address that would make you more supportive of this proposal? And you can go through that process any number of times until you know that you're getting more fours and fives, um, or at least not a lot of threes, um, you know, and then maybe you take it to a vote, but then you have the buy-in that you need to move uh, that forward. So including time for people to speak in meetings is one aspect of respectful communication. I wanna continue and talk more about other aspects of respectful communication. And I just uh, need to make sure I've got, let's see, um, can you see my screen with people sitting around a table at a meeting? Oh, good, okay, great. So, um, so respectful connections and respectful cultures is another part of positive organizations. And I actually like to start talking about respect by talking about the opposite, of, about disrespect or incivility. And so I have a few questions that I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna ask you to think of a time when you were at work and somebody was not civil or somebody was very disrespectful towards you. I'm not gonna ask you to share what the incident was, like what they said or did that was so disrespectful, but I am gonna ask you to take a minute to think about a few questions. And I'm gonna just invite you to post your answers in the chat. So the first question is when somebody treated you in a disrespectful or uncivil way, how did it affect you that day? 
that it happened. And again, you can just post answers to the chat. And if you even want to be anonymous to the group, you can post it just to me. So I'll see your answer, but the group won't know who it is who posted them. So thanks, Ashruti said, I wasn't giving my 100%. And Joan said, it has a lasting effect beyond the actual awards. I was focused on that person's comments all day and started to question my own abilities. Um, it left the issue weighing on my mind. It affected my productivity the rest of the day, ruined an otherwise good day, irritable the rest of the day. Yeah, and that's just completely normal, everything that you're saying. So, so just like one incident of incivility, um, you know, we go back to that fight or flight response, our adrenaline kind of gets released, our blood is all in our extremities and not in our brain. Um, we feel weighed down. Um, uh, somebody said it changed my demeanor and our mindset. It can be very demoralizing um, when um, somebody acts rudely towards us. So definitely uh, our productivity is often shot on um, that day. And actually research about civility says that even people who witness incivility, like their productivity is all, also shot. So it doesn't even always just um, affect the person who was the um, on the receiving end, but it also can affect other people who um, are on, or who are witnesses to that. Somebody said it's embarrassing um, and frustrating. And actually, that question is going to my next um, my, the next question I was going to ask. Stephanie said um, ruined what I thought had been a good relationship building to that point, and that was exactly my next question: was how did it affect your relationship with the person who was disrespectful to you? I wanted to say a quick apology because I might not have kept good track of direct messages versus everyone messages. So if I said anything that you meant me not to say your name, please accept my sincere apology. I'm gonna track that on the next questions. Okay, so, so what people are saying is exactly what I tend to hear. I lost all respect for that person um, and left that job. I avoided working with that person, uh, a lot of losing respect, um, lost a friendship that you had had outside of work, avoiding that person because I didn't want to be around them remain professional, but avoided conversations, cautious about interacting, made me less likely to go above and beyond. Um, tried um, somebody, a, pos a more positive thing somebody said was I tried to speak to them afterwards to see if it was more of a misunderstanding and our relationship did seem to improve. But all kinds of impacts. So communication definitely is gonna break down. People often are less motivated for the work overall, not even just with that person. And um, when people aren't treated well, it's not uncommon for them to either kind of leave emotionally and put less into the job or actually leave and go on to another job. And um, on this one, maybe I will just um, kind of pick up on what was already said rather than kind of having you fill things in, but how did it affect your relationship to the organization? And based on what you all put in the chat, it's clear that um, for some people, it's the same thing that um, that I often hear is that um, if there's if if it's uh, not kind of isolated incident, but people feel like a workplace is tolerating incivility, um, they may also um, feel like this is an organization that they're so excited to be part of. And again, whether they kind of leave in spirit and aren't giving as much or they actually leave. So you can see that incivility has incredible costs. It has costs for the individual who may either have physical or emotional effects of um, being the um, target of incivility. 
who um, is less motivated, who um, isn't as uh, excited about the place and the work and what they're doing. And it has big um, cost for organizations if people are less productive. If there's less communication, because we're avoiding this person, it means that there's not a good flow of communication um, throughout the organization. One time when it's especially difficult sometimes to maintain our civility. So thank you all of you for your um, input into these questions. Um, so one time when, when it's really hard to maintain civ civility is when something goes wrong. And what do you do when there's problems and things don't go as planned? And one aspect of having positive relationships is bringing problem solving rather than finger pointing um, as the response to things that go wrong. Jody hoffa gattel did research on a variety of organizations looking at how the way that workers coordinated with one and another and how the kind of a positive culture in those organizations impacted bottom line results. One of the industries she looked at was healthcare, but she also did a lot of research in the airline industry and identified Southwest as having results that really like punched above their weight for the kind of airline they were compared to their competitors. And the difference she felt was really based on the kind of culture they had. And in interviews with some of the Southwest employees, one person said, if there's a delay, which is a huge issue in airlines because they're losing money if there's a delay and customers aren't happy, um, supervisors find out why it happened. We get ideas on how to do it better next time. If you've got that kind of relationship, then they're not going to be afraid. Say there was a 10 minute delay because freight was excessive. If we're screaming, we won't know why it's late. Somebody else said, we work real hard to remove that barrier so that agents can come in and talk to a supervisor or manager. Even when you did something wrong, they'll ask what happened. You know you screwed up. They'll tell you what you can do so it doesn't happen again. You walk away so upbeat that you work even harder. In airlines, you can imagine how it could really make a difference if a co-pilot is afraid to share a concern with the pilot because they're afraid the pilot's gonna jump down their throat, the plane could crash. And absolutely in healthcare, there are incidents where people were afraid to say something to the attending physician and uh, somebody had uh, the wrong procedure done because nobody, questioned what was happening. And uh, you can have even disastrous results or even death in a healthcare setting. But even in office settings where nobody's life is at risk, if people are scared to speak up and communicate when they are concerned that something might not be quite right, or they have questions, you can still have your project crash with uh, results that are maybe not life or death, but can still be pretty disastrous. Sometimes when we think about respect and how to foster respect within organizations, we really think about individuals, like are, is each individual acting respectfully? But I wanna share a few creative solutions that were focused more on how we can encourage a different kind of atmosphere as a team, rather just kind of thinking, is it one individual who's a bad apple? Christine Porath and Christine Pearson have a book called The Cost of Bad Behavior. And they share a couple of ideas that I really love. So one was a youth soccer league where sometimes the parents got out of hand on the sidelines with their yelling and their comments. And so the youth soccer league, a one team in that league, um, decided to assign a parent to a job of bringing a bag of lollipops to the game. And if anybody on the sidelines was kind of going over the line of what would be appropriate parental behavior, they were handed a sucker to put in their mouth and uh, suck on the sucker rather than yelling at the kids out on the field. And likewise, Christine Korath um, talks about in um, 
the cost of bad behavior and in a more recent work that she has about civility at work, that she had worked in a department where it was known for being a hostile place for people who came to give talks. And they wanted to turn that around. They wanted people to come to continue coming and sharing their research. So they came up with some hand signals. They had one hand signal that um, where they would just hold their fist by the side of their face. And that was telling whoever had just asked a question or commented that they like they were getting a yellow card. They were on notice to clean up their act. And they had a different hand signal holding two fingers and a thumb by the side of their face, kind of like a, you're out of here kind of signal. That was the equivalent of a red card. And that meant that you are not to comment or ask any more questions for the rest of this talk. And um, Horath actually tells of a experience where her department interviewed someone who chose not to come and later she asked them why. And they said, you know, you gave me a better offer financially than the department I went to. But when I was giving my talk, somebody was really um, uh, kind of rude in how they, um, they uh, interacted with me. And I just thought if that's the kind of department this is, I don't think it's a place that I want to be. And it turned out that the person who was rude wasn't even a senior person in the department. They wouldn't have had any say over that person's promotion, but they still took that as a sign of what kind of culture there was and, um, and then didn't want to be there. So coming up with these, um, I think, ways to think of this as an organization, how can we support each other and maybe even make it a little bit more of a game, um, I thought was really a brilliant solution. Part of having a respectful team can start with how you select and how you train people for teamwork. And I wanna share a couple examples of that. So going back to Southwest Airlines, Southwest had a hotshot uh, former Air Force pilot come to interview who was rude to the receptionist and Southwest didn't hire that person for that reason. They felt like even though they, people work across many different um, locations with different airports, they wouldn't know all the people within the organization, but they really wanted to have a culture where everybody respected everybody regardless of where they might be in the work hierarchy for what they did and what they brought to the effort. Another example of selecting and training for teamwork came from a student at the University of Michigan Business School who had interned at LinkedIn. And Jeff Weiner, the head of LinkedIn, had talked a lot about LinkedIn being a compassionate organization. But sometimes organizations talk about being compassionate, but they don't always walk the walk. And the student said that when she was being interviewed for the internship, she was asked a question, which was, if you were getting ready for an important meeting that was coming up and you found out that one of your team members who was gonna take part in the presentation at this meeting had gone into early labor and now they're an hour away from uh, your town and uh, an hour away from where they live in a different hospital, uh, what would you do? And the question wasn't all about to find out all about how she would cover the work getting done, but it was really to get out whether she would have some kind of a compassionate response towards this member of her team who was suddenly in crisis. And you can see that just even by asking questions in an interview that get at uh, what kind of team player are you, even by asking those questions is a way that you're starting to train people that that's something that you value in your organization just by the fact that you're asking. So I'm gonna put us back into breakout rooms and again, give breakout rooms about five minutes to have a conversation about how your department or how your unit already selects or trains for teamwork um, or if you, don't do that now, um, how might you do that? Or how have you seen that done elsewhere? So I'm gonna stop the share and go to breakout rooms. 
and I'm going to recreate these. So hopefully. great. So we're back. And I want to, again, just invite a few people to share what were some of the ideas that came up? Um, I heard some really good stuff in the group that I sat in on, but would love to, um, yeah, hear that some of you share out some of your ideas. So I was really happy to hear from some of our newer employees who actually started working for CTSI during this COVID period. So everyone's been, you know, a lot of folks have been remote, um, not everyone, but, you know, we haven't had, you know, what we would call a normal sort of welcoming kind of training environment, um, you know, that we would have had 18 months ago. Um, so I was really excited to hear that, but I did share um, that we have um, piloted about two years ago, I think we started um, a, a, a leadership kind of training development program with our administrative assistant team. And we we're getting ready to roll that out with our coordinator kind of level group. And then of course COVID happened and the world kind of fell apart and we weren't able to do that. But we do have to kind of get back on um, with that with sort of weekly discussions, um, kind of getting those cohorts to gel a little bit kind of interdisciplinary. So um, we, we hope to do that again soon. Great. One or two other people want to share what were some of the things that came up in your conversation? I think one thing that we talked about was um, <clears throat> in our organization, we have a weekly team meeting so that everybody has a chance to share what they're working on. And then that gives the whole team, you know, kind of the big picture of what's going on. Um, so in, in an instance, like we've experienced recently, if somebody needs to be out, then, you know, everybody kind of knows what, what's being worked on and how to tackle that, so. Nice, nice. Um, somebody who I work with does something in their team meetings where they um, they, they um, have always done and then they added a piece, but they did plates and priorities. So here's what's on my plate. Here are my priorities. So people know kind of what, you know, is going to be most urgent for that person. And then they actually added also, here's what I could use help with um, to even um, invite more reciprocity of people jumping in to help each other with projects. And that also, Sarah, when you were talking about, you know, that regular meeting and people knowing like how to fill in if somebody is not there, reminded me of uh, Jane Dutton is a researcher at the University of Michigan who studied a billing group in a hospital that had a very, um, especially positive culture, like people really wanted to work in that group. And it wasn't because like the work was, you know, necessarily the most fascinating, but they just um, had such a lovely culture. And they had certain things that they all did like, um, if they were in a period of time that was a really heavy um, work time, they would do things like um, just um, to have fun, like they would bring their umbrellas and just set their umbrellas up next to their desk, like kind of like it's raining, like a lot of work's coming down on us and, um, and kind of have other like rain paraphernalia. Or they had regular times where if um, like somebody like, needed help with their work, everybody would stop their other work and everybody would just like help that person with their project for some short period of time to get them caught up. So they really tried to think about how we work together, not just kind of what each doing our own thing here. I had mentioned in the group um, that it was, it was so welcoming, like right off the bat, you felt welcome and like you were part of the team and you had the ability to let everyone know, you know, I need help. I'm, I'm struggling right now. And everyone was so supportive. It's, it was, it's been awesome. So <laughs> I appreciate yeah. all that. <laughs> That's great. That's so great to hear. Um, somebody in the group, I said, and I also talked about cross training and um, the cross training uh, just brought to mind something else that uh, happened at Southwest Airlines, which was people didn't have to know how to do other people's jobs, but um, they wanted them to know enough about other people's jobs to know how you could facilitate their success. And so at other airlines, if they ask somebody like the gate agent, tell me about how you do your job, they explain their job, but only in reference to what they did. 
At Southwest, the gate agent said, well, when we take the bags, we put them on the conveyor belt with the handles all facing this direction because that saves the luggage handlers two minutes when they take the luggage off on the other end. And again, in airline industry, we're getting planes out on time is this hugely important thing. It really mattered for people to just know enough about the, the person's role so they knew how to enable um, their colleagues to be more successful. Um, somebody also in the group I sit in on talked about having a welcome packet that said, welcome to our team, and then have lots of information. And that kind of welcome packet could be, or um, introductory can be both welcome to our team about like procedures, but it could also be like, this is our culture. We like to help each other out here. If you know, we you finish your work, you know, we ask somebody else, do you have anything I can do to help out? Or, you know, whatever it is you might want people to know um, about the culture. Um, and a few people also mentioned the um, strengths uh, finder. That was something that their groups had done and that they found it helpful, especially um, the groups that said that they did some kind of debriefing of that strengths finder afterwards to think about. I'm good at this, you're good at that. How can we um, use our strengths to support each other? And also I think it just feels good for any of us to have reinforced like, yeah, maybe I kind of knew I was good at that, but when you do the strengths finder and it gives you kind of a little like shot in the arm, like, you know, oh, this is actually really something that you can contribute um, that, that allows you to contribute to your team. Anything else anybody wants to add that came up in this question of selecting and training for teamwork? I'm sharing my screen again. Um, okay, so can you see the team of people on the slide? Okay, great. So um, then I wanna go on and talk about another part of what makes for strong relationships and positive relational cultures. And that's having a sense of people caring about who you are, not just for like your function, but who you are as a person. And um, and that often happens through sometimes informal um, connections or through different kinds of rituals of um, recognizing um, life events, both good and bad. And I wanted to share a short part of a video from a group called Hope Lab, which is an organization that makes a video games that um, support young people and teens to follow their medication regimes like uh, I, young people with diabetes to um, take their insulin or things like that. And we're gonna just watch a piece of this video and uh, we'll go ahead and watch. My name is Austin Harley and this is my story about my thriller flash mob goodbye. <laughs> At any organization, you have people coming in and also people leaving. We try to think about what would be special to honor them and celebrate them as they're leaving us. I just thought we have to do something big and silly um, that Austin would enjoy. He loves Thriller. And so the word got out that Austin loves Thriller and then he knows the whole dance. Oh, yeah, no, it's great. I love Thriller. You know, the song itself is really catchy and really well done. It's a little spooky at the same time, but not exactly scary. Yeah, I am a fan of the song. Good. So <laughs> let's do a zombie dance. The day that we rehearsed, we must have had in the conference room 15 people. And we had a YouTube video we were following. It got sweaty in there. Like you're open to the direction you're going to. This would definitely not have happened anywhere I worked before. I've come from a public accounting background and you know, really more consulting type of places. So everything is work, work, work. That is not at all what Hope Lab is about. They like to bring work and play together. The inner fun of everyone here is at like their peak. I thought it was fabulous. I just thought it was really unique and fun. And if the staff were willing to do it, I thought it would really push all of us to an edge of having fun that we've not been to before. 
My name is Austin Harley, um, and this is my story about. Second. Hmm. Okay, so um, I'm just going to pause right there. Um, so I didn't show the whole ending where they actually dress up like zombies and do the zombie dance and invite him to join in, but it's very sweet. He talks about how he like was trying to keep his composure when they surprised him with this and uh, how he felt like uh, his coworkers really knew who he was. Um, and, um, you know, it was clearly something that was a bunch of fun for all of them, but, and, but very also sweet for appreciating um, this person who they were saying goodbye to. I work with a lot of people in very, very busy workplaces. So at most medical centers, um, when I'm doing workshops, people do not necessarily have the time availability to all learn the zombie dance um, if uh, they're uh, getting ready to say goodbye. But I think that um, a kind of rituals and also um, connections that are not always all about just the work are part of what um, connects people and knits people together in a fabric in an organization. And I think that's one thing that's actually been very tough about COVID that there are fewer opportunities to connect in ways that are a little uh, more informal. We just have a few minutes, but before we end, I guess I wanted to ask, um, and maybe we could use chat for this, ask people um, if you might be willing to, um, and you can say if, if you prefer or, or type in chat, what are some ways that you have um, continued to keep people connected even during COVID? Um, around, again, welcomes, goodbyes, uh, life cycle events, or even just how you conduct meetings or communication that acknowledges who people are in addition to their work function. And maybe I'll just share some ideas and then if people think of anything, feel free to jump in in the chat or to um, just go ahead and mention it. So some things that I've seen, one is a group that used Slack as a way to communicate. They also created, in addition to different Slack channels for different projects, they made, it a, made a Slack channel just to post self-care actions that they were doing to support each other to be thinking about self-care as well as work. Um, somebody said that um, our office hosted a drive through retirement party and Zoom celebration. So yeah, having people drive by um, signs in your car windows or something like that can be a nice way to have people feel recognized. Sending team members birthday cards or small treats. Um, our, our office hosted an ugly Christmas sweater Zoom contest. Some groups have used, um, somebody wrote, um, some groups have used um, Zooms like function where you can use um, like rabbit nose and ears or hats or things like that um, on your screen um, uh, to, to kind of change your profile um, in a party. Somebody said their office um, continued their NCAA bracket contest. Um, I know everybody's really disappointed that the U of M men's just fell out of the um, tournament, um, <laughs> like folks here in Ann Arbor. Um, so, um, so I just would encourage people to continue be, to be thinking about those things. A couple other ideas, one group hosted a scavenger hunt um, where um, for a party where they had people find something in the room you found find meaningful and talk about why it's meaningful to you or go find something in your house you've had since high school and bring it back and tell us what it is. Um, was one creative uh, way. And also even just in a regular meeting, starting with a round of um, some kind of icebreaker question, like what's been one silver lining of COVID for you or what's something that's brought you joy in the past week. And I just wanna go ahead then and summarize that we um, talked about today, sharing speaking space and especially doing that in meetings. We talked a lot about respect and different ways to create a culture of respect, including problem solving rather than finger pointing communication and um, selecting and training for teamwork. And we are at 11.30, so I am going to stop us right here and just say a, a big thank you to all of you for your heartfelt participation.
I am going to, um, I sent links to Sierra and Jody for some evaluation forms. I actually really read those and appreciate any thoughts or feedback that you have. So I wanna invite you to fill those out. At the end, there's also an opportunity if you wanna get a newsletter that I send out a couple of times a year with these uh, topics related to uh, these um, workshops this morning or the other kind of topics that I talked about related to my group, then please, um, fill out the evaluation form and you can um, give us your information if you'd like to get that. And we'll turn it again back to Sarah just to see if you have any, any announcements, anything else you want to add.